Anybody glad in the house that we serve a God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we can even ask or you can do? Amen. Amen. We want to thank God for the ministry of, uh, of our dear um, guest singer and to our music ministry. God bless you. Um, there is a word from the Lord today. Um, if you'll join with me in the book of John, we'll be reading um, verse John 1, verse 14, and then we'll be looking at John 2, verses 1 through 12. That's John 1, 14. And John 2, 1 through 12. And the word of the Lord reads, and the word became flesh and lived among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory as of the Father, his only Son, full of grace and truth. Or King James says it, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John chapter 2, reading from verse 1 through 12. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to his servants, do whatever he tells you. Now standing there were six stone jars, stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to them, fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had, had become wine, and did not know where it had come from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs in Cana of Galilee, and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. After this, he went down to Capernaum with his mother, his brothers, and his disciples, and they remained there a few days. I would like to speak to you from this unusual topic for today, um, Turned Up Tuesday. Turned Up on a Tuesday. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. God, we do thank you for your goodness and for your mercy. God, we thank you that you are an able God, God who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all we could even ask or think. So God, in this moment, I pray, God, that you will show up and show your ability. God, hide me behind the cross that they would not hear the words of Daryl, but they'll hear the words of the Savior Jesus calling them to repentance. In no other name but the strong name of Jesus, who is the Christ, amen. Amen. Turned up. Tuesday. The Gospel of John is an amazing book because the Gospel of John introduces to us a new understanding on who Jesus and who God is. Unlike other books, if you, for those biblical scholars out there who spent enough time in church, you know that the Gospel of John has stories that no other Gospel has. John is, is trying to show a different view of who Jesus truly is. See, we understand inside the text that God is a God who is for us, right? We see that throughout the whole corpus of the Bible. The Bible says, if God be for you, then who could be against you? We know that God is a protector, one who will fight for us. That, that's why the scripture says that the battle is not yours, but the battle is the Lord's. We understand that God is a God that is for us, right? But we also understand, and I know this is not Christmas time, but the, but the prophet 
um, Isaiah said that God is a God that is with us. He is Emmanuel, the God who will be with us. We also understand this in the Psalms. He is a present help in the time of trouble. He is our comfort. God is a God that's not only for us, but he's also a God that is with us. Uh, but as Pastor has been talking for the past few weeks through the life of Samson, we also understand that God is a God that will come upon us, that the Spirit of God will come upon us so that we can do extraordinary things in the ordinary course of life. God is a God that's for us. He is with us. He is upon us. And also from the text, we also see um, that God is a God that is inside of us, right? Thank God for the Holy Ghost, right? That on the day of Pentecost, they were sitting in the upper room and the Spirit came down and sat upon their heads and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, right? God is a God that is for us. God is a God that is with us. God is a God that is upon us. God is a God that's also in us, right? But the distinction that all those kind of understandings of, of God and who Jesus is, it makes a difference between who God is and who we are. There are prepositions. They are ways to show that at the end of the day, it is God that may be for us, but he's not He's not us, right? He's a God that is with us, which means that he's beside us. He's a God that's upon us, which means that he's on top of us. He's a God that lives inside of us, which means, but there's still a difference between God and man. At the end of the day, all the course, all the scripture shows us that there is a difference between God and man, which makes the person of Jesus so different and makes this person of John, what John is saying to us, so different. It's that John kind of breaks down this wall between God and man and says, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. But then he goes further and says, but the word became flesh which means that God moved it from a preposition into a verb. He said, before he was with us and for us and in us and among us, but now God is us. God became like human flesh so that he could understand what we go through and so we can live, so that we can then so that he can better understand every pain that we feel, every desire he was tempted by. God became like man, that's what Augustine said, so that man can become like God. He's for us, he's with us, he's upon us, he's in us. But most importantly, we, as we understand who Jesus is, as it relates to the book of John, we get to see the true humanity of who Jesus is. God is no longer removed from our situation. But he, as, as the scripture says, he pitched his tent in our situation and became subject to the complexities and the mundanity of our human existence. Jesus, our Lord and Savior, Jesus came down from heaven and took on this robe of flesh. Jesus said that it was not enough for me to be for you and with you. Jesus said it's not enough for me to be even inside of you. Jesus said it's not enough for me to even be upon you. But Jesus said, I gotta try this out for myself. So I can better understand what they go through, but that they can also better understand that I understand what you're going through. It's a two-way street that's going on. We understand God a little bit better, but God also understands our situation just a little bit better. So Jesus, that's understanding is important for us. So Jesus, after becoming flesh, he then comes to this, we come to this story. John wants to set this up and say that to a certain extent, Jesus is no longer just God. And he's not just man, but he is this God man, both 100% God and yes, also 100% man. Which brings us to this text. That understanding is important as we start to engage this text today. Because Jesus is now just having the, the creator of the universe the, the one who came down from glory, the, the one who angels foretold and prophets foretold for generations and centuries before, he shows up at a wedding. 
Jesus in chapter 1 just had the Spirit come upon him. And he was just baptized by John and said, Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. And then he calls his disciples. And then what does Jesus do? He goes to a party. Jesus, who has the heaven open up and says, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. You would think that Jesus would then go on and start just healing everybody. But what Jesus decides to do is show up at a party. The Bible says here, Jesus, verse 1, on the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. One of the things that this new understanding of Jesus allows us to see is that Jesus does not have to wait until Sunday to get the job done. That Jesus turns up on a Tuesday. The Bible says on the third day, the third day being Tuesday, on the third day when there there was a wedding in the Cana of Galilee, on the third day, just Anybody, everybody knows about Tuesdays. Tuesdays is one of those forgetful days. One of those days that you really don't spend too much time. Monday, you're kind of annoyed about the world. Tuesday, you're like, all right, I'm just getting to my thing. Friday, you can wait to get, for, to get to Friday. So Tuesday is just a mundane day. But Jesus says it is just Tuesday, and he shows up ready to perform. That's good news for us today because we don't have to wait till Sunday. We don't have to wait for no preacher. We don't have to wait for no teacher. The God who is now us, the God who is now with us, among us, for us, and upon us will show up on a Tuesday and change the whole trajectory of your wedding and change the whole trajectory of your party. At the end of the day, this is not some big miracle. This is not somebody being healed. This is not somebody's life being transformed. All they're going to do is have a little bit more fun. And Jesus took some time out of his day after having the spirit fall upon him just to show up at a wedding on a Tuesday. So he shows up on this ordinary Tuesday in this mundane city of Cana of Galilee and the mother of Jesus shows up to him, comes up to him and says, guess what Jesus? They out of wine. We just established a few minutes ago that this is, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. The word was God. This is God. And Mary says to him, they don't got any wine. He didn't, she didn't say, Jesus, there's somebody that's sick. There's people struggling in poverty. There's so much hell going on around us. They got first century COVID. Who knows what they had? But, but what did Mary say? They, they out of wine. And what Jesus says back to them, back to her, says, woman, which is not so offensive. I know right now it sounds pretty offensive. I ain't calling my mama woman, right? But, but woman, it's really more like ma'am. What concern is that to you and me? My hour has not yet come. And Mary said, boy, I done labored with you for nine months put up with the shame and agony of people think I had Harry, Tom, and John around. But you decide to come back to me and say, my hour is not yet come. Mary just turned to the servants and just said, just do whatever he says to do. Which means that he's going to take care of this, right? Mary had the assurance because of this new relationship between God and man that we are not in a relationship with God. Before it was such that we were just Um, From the Old Testament point of view, we were just merely like robots almost. We just operated. We did whatever he willed. So, and any time you spoke back to God, God would give you a long answer. And it would be not an answer that you really cared about. We check it out in the text. Job, and Job said, God, what is going on? And I don't understand what you're doing left and right here, there, and otherwise. And God said, now, Job, just shut up for a second. Where were you when I put the heavens in the, in the sky and dan- dangled the stars in the sky? Where were you when I formed the earth out of my hand? Where were you when I did all this? But now we are enter- entering a new understanding of the relationship between God and man because before it was always predicated that I, I need God to do this because of a particular need that I may have. At the end of the day, This text shows us that God not only cares about our needs, catch this, but God also cares about our wants. 
I know, we, I know we preach a lot about God's needs, about our needs. We need God to show up in, in, in the courtroom. We need God to show up in the hospital room. We need God to show up in all these areas of our life. But what the text suggests to us today is God not only cares about your needs, but he also cares about your desires. He not only cares about your needs, but he also cares about the things that you may want. And if there's anything this text shows us is that God will show up just for your needs, but he also will show up from time to time for the things that you may want. Because in the grand view of God, from God's point of view, God really doesn't need anything, right? If God needed something, he would then cease to be God. Because if that would require, and that would mean that God is in want and desire something that he cannot produce. So God never needs anything. He doesn't need me to wake up in the morning. He doesn't need me to get started on my way. He doesn't need me to do this, and he doesn't need me to do that because he has all power in his hand. He can do it very much so himself, which means that when I do wake up in the morning, I should be grateful. I should be thankful. I should give him some praise because the reason why he did it is not because he needed to, but because he wanted to. And because God wanted to means that every time I open up my mouth and get up out of bed, I am living in the pleasure and the favor of God. Every time he makes a way out of no way, it's not because he needed to make a way out of no way. It's because he wanted to make a way out of no way. And because he wants to do that, I now live in the pleasure of God. He doesn't need to do it, but he sure enough wanted to do it. Huh. I'm reminded when I was a kid, I would go to the supermarket. My dad did all the supermarket shopping, probably most likely to ensure that, you know, it was kept in a certain budget. So my dad, I would go with my dad on Fridays, and we would go um, um, to the local supermarket in Brooklyn, and we would walk down the aisles. And, you know, I would make sure, you know, if I left it up to my dad, he would get Fruity O's when I really wanted Fruit Loops, right? Y'all know what Fruity O's are. I, it's the one, the bagged one, right? I wanted Frosted Flakes that he would probably show up with toasted corn or something like that, right? The off-brand stuff. So I would go with my dad from time to time, and we would go down through the supermarket. And every time we got to the end of the line, and we got to the checkout line, that is, and we got all the rice, and we got all the meats, and we got all the toiletries and all those things, and the cart would be full. Every time we got to the checkout line, I would notice that there's always this bubblicious gum that would just stare at me. And every so often, I'll take the gum, and it will magically appear inside the cart. And every time it appeared inside my, the cart, my father would take it out and say, not right now. Like, not this week. Don't try me this week. You'll probably get annoyed. He just, sometimes you just take it out and don't even say a thing, right? But every now and then, my father would then see it inside the cart and just would look the other way. He knows I don't need no bubblicious gum. But he knew that I really wanted this bubblicious gum. And every so often, God, every so often, my father would take the gum and make the cashier check it out and I would enjoy this gum all for the 10 seconds that it lasted, right? It's the same thing that God sometimes do with our lives, right? God, he promised to provide for our needs. He promised to provide us food and provide us shelter and to take care of our needs. But every now and then, God will throw in a little something that you weren't expecting. I don't know about you or the other, but God, every now and then, God will open up the windows of heaven and will pour you out a blessing that you have no room to receive every now and then. I'm not saying every day this is the case, but we are in this new relationship with God that is not just, I just need God for my needs, but every now and then God will give me a little something that I really, really want. And so every time he blesses me, any way he blesses me, I have to give him some praise and give him some glory because he not only provides my needs, but he gives me my wants. Mm -hmm. 
they, 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 they didn't want the, it, it, it was just wine that was going on here. There, there, there was nothing, uh, um, there, there was nobody being healed, there was no one being saved here, it was just some wine. It was a lot of wine at that. We will get to that. I'm not encouraging y'all to go have wine after this. I'm just saying, this is what the text is saying. But one of the things that we see inside this text is God in the person of Jesus, who is the Christ, shows up and turns up in this situation to cover some of our shame. See, you have to understand inside this text that it would be perceived as non-hospitable. They only had two drinks in the ancient world. They didn't have Kool-Aid and fruit punch. There was only wine and water. Sometimes the water, most of the time, wasn't bad, was bad, so you had to drink a lot of wine. So to show up at this wedding, and then, y'all could, y'all could see this picture in your own lives, right? Imagine you show up at a wedding, and you get to the wedding, after stay, you know they already started the wedding late. And, they, and you show up late, and now you're sitting at the reception. And you didn't eat no food or do anything before that. Y'all, everyone has one of these stories. And you show up, and they ran out of food. You would say to yourself, I ain't never going back to anything they're throwing. Right? This is the same thing that was going on inside this text. They had to make sure that the wedding feast, which lasted for about seven days, that you had to ensure that you had enough food and enough wine for everybody that would show up. Because if you didn't, then when it came time for you to marry off your next son or your next daughter, nobody would get married to y'all because they understood that y'all don't got no money and y'all cannot provide. Y'all didn't plan this out right. Y'all got no coordination. You got no organization skills. Do you know Just stay away from the family. And in that shame culture, that would have ruined the prospects of that whole family for generations to come. But Jesus, after coming from the water, but Jesus understood that this is just some trivial issue. This is not life or death, but Jesus understood what was going on and said, I've got the opportunity in this moment to cover their shame and produce this wine so that they could then live a life of prosperity and keep on going. Aren't you glad that there are some situations in our lives that if the truth be told, you would be thrown out the church, thrown out your job, thrown out your marriage, thrown out every situation, but Jesus showed up in the midst of your situation and he said what you need for this situation maybe you need a little wine but maybe you need a little peace I will cover it up I will cover your shame so that you can go on and live your life but Jesus he will show up and turn up into your situation so that you can live a life of holiness and freedom but Jesus just to cover some shame, he will show up. Mm. So, Jesus covers the shame because of their piss poor planning. And, but Jesus. Mm. So, Jesus then, thank you, Reverend. But Jesus, now standing, there were six stone jars for the Jewish rites of purification each holding 20 jars, 20 or 30 gallons. And they filled them up to the brim. And now Jesus said, draw some out and take it to the chief steward. But the text says here, when the steward tasted the water that had become wine and did not know where it came from, the steward called the bride's groom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine. Until now. Hmm. So y'all get this. When you started off the party, they brought out the Hennessy. But at the end of the party, they brought just that brown juice you found in, in, in the corner store. When you started off, you had the Belvedere. But now you've got some cheap Russian vodka at the end. That's what, they, that's what you normally do, right? You, oh, 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 y'all been to some of these parties I see, right? Jesus, when they 
tasted this wine. They recognized that this wine was better than what they first gave. Which means that when Jesus shows up into your situation, in this new relationship he has with us now, the things that started off bad, the things that started off good, and you th then started going bad, he's able to turn up and transform situations. The same way how he transformed water into wine. Jesus, any situation he turns up in, he transforms it so that it is better when he left than when he came. Any situation that Jesus shows up in will become better after he had left than when he came. I don't know about you. I have a lot of water pots around, but I've never seen Jesus turn my water into wine. But I have seen Jesus show up in my situation. And I've seen him change my sorrow into joy. I may not have water to wine, but I've seen Jesus change me from a victim to a victor. I do not, might not have water to wine, but I've seen Jesus take this test and turn it into a testimony. I may not have water to wine, but he has taken my, my hurt and transformed it to healing. I may not have water and that he turned it to wine, but he made this sinner into a saint. The song said that he picked me up and he turned me around and he places my feet on the solid ground. I don't know about you this morning, but aren't you glad that Jesus, when he steps into your situation, he will change you from you will leave better than you came. You will leave stronger than you came. You will leave wiser than you came. I don't know about you, but aren't you glad this morning that my Jesus will turn things around? He's turning, he's turning, he's turning our situations around. This same Jesus that turned water into wine is still in the transformation business. I don't know what your situation is. I don't know what you've given up hope on, but if the Lord of the universe can stop down in lowly Cana to stop by a wedding and turn water into wine. I'm sure you've got a situation that is more pressing than some wine. That if he's willing to do this thing for wine, just imagine what he's willing to do in your life. He is willing to transform and to change and to turn your life around. So if there's anyone here this morning the greatest transformation we can offer you this morning is that transformation from sinner to saint. The greatest transformation we can offer you this morning is one of disconnection to connection to the God who understands and sympathizes with our weakness. Today we want to offer you Christ, this Jesus, who cares about you so much that he will leave glory and come down to lowly, smelly Judea, suffer and die on a cross, and raise, tr rise up triumphantly so that we can have just a little bit more of a good time. He did all of that so we can have a good time. This is the Christ, this is the Jesus that we offer you today. So if you, if you are also looking for a church community, we're not perfect. We're just in the process of being transformed ourselves. We are just only becoming better. And we get better and better as each year goes on. So if you need a Christ a, and if you need a church, I'd like to give you that opportunity now. Just join, come down the aisle and and take one of these deacons' hands and we'll be sure to lead you to our Christ and to his church. Thank you. And
And if you have any prayer requests, please put them in the chat. Yes, yes. We would love to pray with you. When we come back, we shout and pray with you. Oh! 